Welcome to Good News being brought to you by Listening for Clues. We are Lauren Welch and John Shematek Higgins in the Episcopal Diocese of Maryland. We sure are. And today we have a very special guest with us, Markeisha E. Wilson. Markeisha is a human capital consultant, a leadership coach, an author, and an expert in change management. In her bio that she provided for a TEDx talk that she's given about forgiveness as a powerful tool in the workplace. This is how she describes herself. Being an authentic leader is difficult, and especially difficult if you are a woman. Even more challenging if you are a woman of color. She is a human capital professional with over 15 years of proven experience in strategizing and partnering with leadership teams to design and empower dynamic workforces. Markeisha is a leadership coach with a unique ability to ignite growth through challenge. She is an expert level facilitator and designer of highly rated interactive leadership and communications courses for adult learners in the defense and financial industries. Welcome, Markeisha. We are thrilled to have you today. I am thrilled to be here, John and Lauren. Thank you so much for this opportunity to share with your listening audience and for this invitation just to chat with y'all. I'm super excited about it. Markeisha, we are too. It's a joy to have you with us. So you are a human capital consultant uh, that helps leadership teams to empower their workforces. What inspired you to, to do this in the first place? Oh, what a great question. You know, there are some things that find you, right, that you're doing, and then you realize, oh, shoot, there's a title for this. For me, <laughs> I was doing training and development work and spent a lot of time uh, working with different groups. And during those training sessions, so many of them would say, well, you know, it's a bigger problem than we're being trained for. Training isn't always the answer. And that was really clear to me as a training and development professional. The training is often given as the answer for many organizational problems and for leadership challenges. So I was able to see that and found an opportunity to get into an organization where I could speak to leaders at their level about creating strategies that would go further than a four hour training. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it sure does. Now, what has impressed me is I've learned something about you and listened to your TEDx talk, which I highly recommend to folks yeah. to do that. It's fairly brief. I mean, it was only like 12 minutes or something, right? That's the requirement. TEDx talk can actually only be 13 to 17 minutes. Did you know that? Okay. No, I did not know that. <laughs> That's a rule. But it was fascinating to me that the topic that chose you or that you chose, I don't know quite how that worked, was forgiveness in the workplace. Because I know, you know, when you're reading your uh, resume, it's it's really all about work and management and executives and, and so on. And yet your talk was about forgiveness. Yes. So, John, being that you you both are in the church, you understand what it means to be called an answer to a higher power. And, and I'm a Christian as well. That topic literally chose me. The conference was set up already, the TEDx conference, to focus on forgiveness. I was a late ad when I met the coordinator of the author's tour. And they said to me, well, the topic is forgiveness. We'd love you to speak. What can you share about that? And I just deer in headlights like, wait a minute. This is honestly, John and Lauren, I was thinking this is actually the last thing I want to talk about. <laughs> Be in full transparency. And then as I, I worked on what my offer would be to the community, yeah, it made so much sense. It came to me like, boom. Forgiveness is missing in the workplace. And originally, that was my original title, is that forgiveness is missing in the workplace. And that's how the topic came to be. And it's something that I, I firmly believe in. There are so many situations that occur at work that we don't get over. 
and we can't get over. And even in my talk in the 13 minutes, you'll see that I don't necessarily say you're going to have to get over. It's really about releasing what has happened so that you can get to the next thing. You spend much more time at work than you do anything else. I think the statistic that I quote in there is that the only thing you spend more time doing is sleeping in life, aside mm -hmm. from being at work, right? And so a lot of things can occur in all of those relationships. And we, again, we train around them. We consult around them. We strategize around them. We write, write you up in HR about it, but we don't talk about how you can release it and move forward. Yeah, and I think that was one of the messages that really struck me in your in your 13-minute talk was about <laughs> the forgiveness. You, you know, you say the old adage for forgive and forget, and you say, no, you don't you don't forget. You don't you have don't. to forget. It's a it's you a memory that you have. Can't. Yeah. Yeah. So can you say some more about the releasing and and, and letting go yeah. rather than forgetting? Yes. And, and, you know, since I've done this talk, Lauren, I have been asked this question. Now I'm an expert on it. I'm like, wait a minute. Am I an I'm still working. Listen, we're all works in progress in many ways, right? So the releasing to me has become, for lack of a better phrase, a brainwashing. It is a brainwashing and a heart washing, right? I believe that the heart only has so much capacity to mm -hmm. hold. It can hold joy, hate, hurt, pain, but it only has so much capacity. So if I'm holding on to the pain of someone offending me in the workplace, making some insulting comment, if I'm holding on to the hurt of not being invited to participate in this leadership thing or that thing, if I'm holding on to offense, of any of any kind, any any sort of negative problem that I've had, that gives me less capacity to enjoy the work that I'm doing. And so I have to force myself to process, to think on the positive things, right? We know that that is in Philippians, right? Think on these things that are positive. There's a very specific reason that exists because the more time you're thinking on what's positive, what's what's beautiful, what's just, what's right, the less time you have to think on who pissed me off at work and how I'm gonna get back at them. And oh, when I'm boss, I'll do this. So for me, it's about intentionally forcing my thoughts on the positive so that I push down and push out the negative. That's really the only way I can speak of it. Now, in our coaching training that I've done at Georgetown University, we talk about changing neural pathways and so on. And, and that's the science of it all. But that's the truth of it for me on the day-to-day -day basis is a brainwashing. Markeisha, you cannot think about how these people got on your nerves. You have to think about the joy that you feel when you mentor a junior consultant. And that's what works for me. Yeah, Lauren and I have so often said the joy is what's missing. And this is one of these yeah. amazing themes, it sounds like, in your life. I, I wanted to ask you, Markeisha, in, in the uh, TEDx talk and also uh, in your book, you were really vulnerable. Mm -hmm. You shared some very painful information about, uh, about your past, your relationship with your parents, your father's death. And I'm just wondering, have you incorporated that also in your leadership training and your consulting? Do you show that kind of vulnerability when you thought of, think about, I am an audacious black woman yes. and I'm going to model this. And on the, yeah. on the one hand, and on the other hand, here you are with your heart open. Yeah. Wow. There's like 10,000 ways I can answer this question. So I'll go the easiest way. The easiest way is have I incorporated it in my trainings and my work with women? The answer is yes, in a very strategic way, in that I believe that all of the, the pain and things that I have gone through has enabled me to put work pain in its proper perspective. Hmm. So that's w one of the things that I think occurs in the lives of men and women is we endure a lot at home put on a nice suit, cover it up and come to work. 
And I, I bring that forward by saying, I did that for years, right? Showing up nicely dressed and stuffing down all of this pain and regret and sadness, right? And so the vulnerability that I show in the book, I believe, oh gosh, there's so many ways I could go with this, but the, what I believe about that is that I was at a place where I realized that those things that I went through enabled me to go through and thrive in the work environments that I had endured as well. I didn't realize that really, if I'm being honest, until I was putting the book together because I initially and intentionally set out to give a blueprint to women and men and young people to follow these eight steps to get through corporate America. But in the writing of it, I realized that I was going to be using stories. And as I got to each story, I realized, yeah, that was the lesson there. If I could take the troubled relationship with my mother, endure that, still love her to the best of my ability through that, then surely I could figure out how to come to work and take all kinds of things from upper management process it, smile, and push through it. It was sort of one fed the other. So when I when I speak in a vulnerable sense or, or speak from my vulnerability, those challenges that I've had, I know that I'm speaking from a place of experience and strength. And it can make those workplace challenges that feel insurmountable. It puts them in their proper perspective. Something else to just to say and your listeners don't know this, you probably don't know this, that I, I share when I, I give my book signings and things is that my book went on Amazon October 21st, 2021. I do talk about this in the TED Talk. And that is the same day that my father took his own life. <sighs> and, and we're coming up on that anniversary. So I'm already like huh, getting to that part where you know when you come up on the anniversary of things. And I tried, I just was like, God, in his divine timing, there's, I was trying to focus on the book, but there was no way for me to separate them now, right? You're asking me, do you bring it in? Well, I don't, I can't separate them now because they occurred on the same day. And what I can say to people is life is like that. Life is like that. You can be on an extreme high and plummet in moments to an extreme low. And it's getting through those lows because you have the encouragement of the high that gives you hope, right? That you can get through them to the next side, to the other side. So I, I can't get away from it now, John. And it's mm -hmm. like, they're, they're linked forever. These stories. Mar Markeisha, you are integrating your whole life. So yeah. together, I mean, so that the pain teaches you a lesson and you can get through to the joy by working with it because we do have to work with the pain. We can't just ignore it. We can't. In the beginning, you were stuffing down. What has surprised you with all that you're doing and working with the people that you work with? Oh, I love this question, Lauren. The, what has surprised me is the impact on people I just did not expect, right? So when I wrote the book, I pictured young Marquishas, right? Like coming into corporate America, you're young, you're black, people have told you you're brilliant, you've been the only this, that, only, only, only a lot in these rooms and you need some support. So I pictured little Marquishas. I also pictured little Lawrence, like, okay, starting my career, how do I make it through male dominated corporate America? So I pictured women of all shades. I pictured young Haritha's. I pictured women of all shades, right? I did not picture Johns being impacted by my book, but there are Johns and Donnie's and Rick's who have reached out to me 
saying this book has impacted them. And, and that has been the biggest surprise because I, I, I really thought women will pick it up, right? My friends will read it. And I thought people would just, you know, read it to see if they were in the acknowledgements, but <laughs> the acknowledgements, that was the hardest thing for people, for me to write. People keep asking, what was the hardest chapter? The acknowledgements, because I kept changing it, adding a person, but, <laughs> but I really just didn't expect that. And a, a friend of mine who shared this book with her brother and he said to her, wow, that really helped me. I've been depressed. And that completely shocked me. I just, I just didn't expect it to have that impact on different types of people. And let me affirm that as someone who's read your book a little skeptically at first, because I thought, you know, what, does, what could this possibly have to say to me? And yet the day that I read it, it helped me with something that happened the day before. So, you know, an old white guy can benefit from this. And somebody who is, you know, retired and not in the corporate world. I was at one time, but now I'm in kind of in the church world primarily and in the podcasting world. It's applicable. It applies to everyone's yeah. life situation. So yeah. I just got to thank you for, for doing this. It's, and the way that you the way that you did it. So you're an author now in this book. Uh, I, I imagine triggers people's interest in you and so on. What is it that you do on a day-to-day basis that's, that's making a difference? Is this a consulting business? Do you, yeah. do you do motivational speaking types of things? I'm very much like my daughter-in-law. I've got, <laughs> I've got Excel spreadsheets for everything. So I'm very task and list-oriented. So we need that kind of person in the world for sure. Yeah. But could you tell us a little bit about your daily work and how that is actually making a difference in people's lives? Sure. My daily work, I spend, I, I dare not draw the percentages out, but I spend probably most of my time still doing human capital consulting. I work in a couple of government organizations and some intelligence communities around people problems. So I make a difference there working on leadership development programs and organizational development challenges that they're facing. So that's what most of my actual work looks like. And then with regard to the book, I've been invited to, to talk about my book and a number of different organizations and even family groups and <laughs> book clubs. So most of my time that was still spent doing the consulting. And I also take on a few, very few executive coaching clients. I'm very, very, very picky about the executive coaching clients I take on uh, because I like to spend real time getting into their true challenges. So I would say a third, a third, and a third, I guess, is how mm -hmm. I spend my time. And making a difference in the world. If I could just say, you didn't ask me this question, but I just want to tell people that I finally figured out what I want to be when I grow up. Wow. I, I figured it out like three years ago when I left corporate America on October 9th, 2020, at the height of the pandemic, right? On my great granny's birthday. But I want to be a philanthropist. So in order to give money, I need to make money. So my only purpose now in making more money is to give more money away. This year, I was able to give away three scholarships to students, all different ages, and they all look different. So I just want to continue to work so that I can continue to give. That's what I want my future life to look like. So being on a podcast like this is what I want my life to look like so that I can reach more people and do more good. Yeah, that's amazing. And I think it really ties into one of your one of your eight uh, messages in your book about generosity. It. It's the whole thing. It is yeah. my number one core value is generosity. Yeah. 
Yeah. Beautiful. It's all I want to do. Beautiful. And you got to make money to give money. I, I, I just learned that recently. <laughs> <laughs> so, Markeisha, with, with all your work and all that you do, it sounds like everything that you do, enjoy it. What else do you do for fun? If you... <laughs> so glad you asked me that question. <laughs> Outside of In the Climb... <laughs> For fun, I am addicted to travel and desserts. I've really had to work on the dessert thing because now that I'm a woman of a certain age, things show up in ways you don't want them to, <laughs> right? <laughs> and that affects my travel outfits. But I love to travel. I'm obsessed with the Caribbean. I spend as much time getting there and spending time on beaches. I got to keep my tan going, you know. <laughs> so that is what I do for fun. When I can't travel, I go to concerts. I'm too thrilled. One of my great friends just got us tickets yesterday to go see Madonna in DC Ooh. in December. <laughs> so I go to concerts and I, I travel. I was at the hip hop 50th concert in the Bronx. But yeah, that's what I do for fun. I haven't done it in a bit, but I have done some acting through my church. Ooh. Yes. I did a lot of that, but we put it on pause because of COVID. So, but I'd love to get back into acting. Yeah, you, you have done that in the past. I know, even in, in your college days, right? Yes, yeah. did some improvisational theater. Yeah. It helped. <laughs> I, <laughs> moments like these. I wish I had that background too. <laughs> so, you know, the, the other thing I'm kind of curious about, Markeisha, is you're totally unashamed about your faith. You talk about it in your book. You have quotations from scriptures. You paraphrase. <laughs> you, you have an NIV according to Markeisha, <laughs> something like that at the end of it. I know your faith has sustained you through so many mm -hmm. difficult times. How, how else has your, has your life experience or your faith as a Christian woman kind of informed your spiritual life? Yeah, it, it is. It is my my Christian walk is my whole hope for tomorrow. It, it's what gets me through. It's my source of strength. It is my blueprint for living. It, it is my source of joy. It is everything to me, right? If I can just tell you one little thing about the TED Talk, when there's a rule, you can't bring up God in a TED Talk. Wow. And they said that is one of the many reasons why TED Talks don't get published because you can do one and they don't publish them all. I was, I, I felt blessed that they published mine, but you cannot mention God. And at first I was like, I don't want to do it. How am I going to not say God? And I heard God say, listen, <laughs> You got to get the word out. This is, these are ways to get the word out without getting the word out, right? Mm -hmm. People will watch mine and then they'll find me and then they'll find what, what sustained me through my childhood, through trauma, through the death of two parents. You'll find that it was God that enabled me to become successful when I shouldn't have been. When I graduated college early, you'll find it was God that enabled me to be the only black woman in these spaces and be respected and make it through disrespect. You'll find that it was God in everything that I have done. So I took the opportunity to do the TED talk to speak without saying God, but he's everything to me that I, you know, when he says I am, he was talking to Markeisha. I am whatever Markeisha needs. That was just for me, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, uh, you, don't have to, you don't have to say God to share the divine presence because you are the divine presence. Mm, thank you. Yeah, I feel the same about you guys. It's uh, true. Thanks. Thanks so much. I do want to just kind of, and I, I have it right here, Marquisha. This is oh, your book. That looks familiar. <laughs> it looks thanks, familiar. Yeah. It's yeah. called, it's got a very long subtitle, like most books have these days. It's called In yes. the Climb, Eight Audacious Actions to Overcome Life and Climb the Corporate Ladder 
with joy. There's that joy message again. And okay. is this a bird of paradise on there? It is sure the... is. Okay. Yes. The story behind the cover of the book. Yeah, please. I, I love the cover. Oh, yes. So I had, you know, in the book that I lived in St. Thomas. So I asked one of my friend's daughters who was studying art at Parsons to paint the cover of my book. She interviewed me, asked me about the book. And at that time I had barely written anything. I didn't know anything that I was going to put in the book. And then she started to ask me to send a couple of pictures. And so I did. And then she started to ask me what the favorite flower of my mother was and the favorite flower of my niece. And she knew the favorite flower of a gentleman named Fletcher for whom I thank in the book. And that was the bird of paradise. And so the flowers on the book and throughout the book are intentional and they are symbolic of people. The white calla lily, my mother's favorite flower, the purple flower, which I can never remember the name of is my niece's flat favorite. And the pink calla lily is my favorite flower. So that's the story behind the cover of the book. Wow. It's beautiful. And it's actually quite a, a beautiful painting. Yes. It's Let's hanging see. in my living room right now. Yeah. <laughs> There's your yes. pink. Yeah. Fantastic. I love it. Good. So let's see, Markeisha, I feel so connected to you today. And this I also feel like this is one of those times where I, I look at Laura and afterwards and say, we've been on holy ground here. I should have taken my shoes off. I mean, this is like amazing. I thoroughly enjoyed this. I'm just wondering, though, I'm sure there are people that are going to want to reach out to you. They're going to read the book. They're going to want to contact you or learn more about you. How can they do that? Awesome. Well, sure. The book in the climb is on Amazon and the audiobook version just came out last month on Audible. The cover is different on that one. Intentionally, by the way, I took off my face. So Johns would look at it and say, hey, I might want this book. <laughs> <laughs> beautiful, beautiful. Okay, so that's on Amazon. On Instagram, you can go on there. I mean, look, I'm not a big Instagram person, but it's Wilson Chapman Coaches, C-O-A-C-H-E-S at the end, okay. Wilson Chapman Coaches. My website is Wilson-Chapman, C-H-A-P-M-A-N.com. That's really the best way to get me. But if you want to shoot me an email, it's PursueJoy at Wilson-Chapman.com. How oh, amazing. Great. And we'll put all those uh, links in our show notes so our viewers and listeners can find them easily and, and get to you easily. So, Markeisha, thanks. I've just, I've just really enjoyed our conversation today. This has Me been great. Me too. Me too. It's been such a thrill to meet you both and share this time with you. I hope your listeners are, are continue to be blessed by your podcast. And thank you for what you're doing. Bad news is on 24 seven on about 40% of the channels that we watch and good news is almost never, ever on. So I love that you all are doing this for the kingdom and I appreciate the opportunity to be a part of it. Thank you. Markeisha, before we leave, you have shared so much wisdom with us already. Is there anything else you would like to share? Ah, sure. It is that in all that you do, remember that someone needs exactly what you have. And all that you become, remember to still make time to give that thing that only you have to other people. That's all I got. Mm. Thank you. That was, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Yes, oh, yeah. thanks so much. Thank you. What a joy this has been. I hope I get to come on again. <laughs> Listen, we're going to do another series next year, so we would love to have you back. Joan and I also want to thank all those who are watching and listening with us today. We cannot do this without your participation. So please take a moment to comment, like, and share on all your social media sites. And again, Thank you for the gift of your time with us today. Until next time, peace and blessings. 
Good News is being brought to you by Listening for Clues. You can find us on our website, listeningforclues.com, our YouTube channel, our Vimeo channel, and just about every podcast platform that there is. Hope to see you soon.